And here we are in episode 10, and yes, they actually teased Benjen in the opening. There is this moment of absolute hope and fear simultaneously. Am I actually going to find out what happens to Benjen? Or is he going to be having a three-way with some white walkers? And so our episode opens with Melisandre watching the ice melt. And she's very proud of herself in a post hoc ergo propter hoc way. Now, I don't care if it's 85 degrees out, snow doesn't melt that fast. And if it did, you'd be walking around in a couple feet of water. So Stannis finds out that half of his men have deserted him in the middle of the night. So I guess that heat wave hit at nighttime, allowing everyone to leave? And it's pretty crazy that half the army left without anyone noticing. Unless... We'll get back to this. Anyway, Stannis should have guessed that a large number of people wouldn't have been cool with children getting burned. I don't care if the burning of Shireen was George R. R. Martin's idea. It was really stupid. Unless... We'll get back to this. And to add insult to injury, Stannis' wife has killed herself. Now I still don't understand how Stannis is going to get to Winterfell. All of his food is gone, and the horses are gone. The map showed him at Long Lake, so he should be weeks away from Winterfell by foot. Maybe now he's going to fish that lake like he should have done before. Anyway, at the wall, Jon is telling Sam about the White Walkers. Why isn't he telling everyone? Jon, there's a serious morale problem in the Watch. People don't trust your decisions. Alistair Thorne has told you that many times, and Ollie looks really angry. How about this? How about you tell the whole Watch what you saw at Hardhome? You have all of those other guys to back you up. Now one could argue that John isn't very observant, but he actually calls himself the most hated man at Castle Black. So he's well aware of the problem. Anyway, Sam requests getting sent to Old Town to become a maester. Now this scene actually demonstrates why people in the Night's Watch don't have wives. John says that he needs Sam, but Sam convinces John to send him to Old Town because he loves Gilly so much. Now I'm not saying the book's logic is very good. Sending Sam away for years when a war seems imminent seems a little weird. But at least in the book, Jon sends Sam to Old Town to gain skills that the Night's Watch will use. He's acting as a Lord Commander, and not a friend. Anyway, Sam reveals that he had sex with Gilly, and Jon is like, Yeah, you hit that shit! Yeah, bro! Hey, remember when the Night's Watch had vows? Man, that was a time. And so Sam, Gilly, and her three-year-old baby head for Old Town. Meanwhile in the north, foodless Stannis is walking through the knot slush towards Winterfell. And he made it. I guess it was only like a two-hour walk. At Winterfell, Sansa uses her bottle opener to get out of her room and enters the Winterfell yard. And no one cares. Oh well, she's only the Lady of Winterfell and the Key to the North. Whatever. And so Pod spies Stannis' army and runs to tell Brienne, who's been intently watching a window for months? Anyway, just seconds after Brienne leaves, the candle lights up. Hold on, am I supposed to believe that a candle in the daytime can be seen at that distance? And let's say it can, where are the other candles in the other windows? And so quite suddenly, we have the Battle of Ice, something book readers have been waiting for for years. And, oh man, Stannis is fucked. Greatest military commander in the Seven Kingdoms, and he's not even in formation. Unless, we'll get back to this. So anyway, even though the battle is clearly in a field, Stannis ends up in the woods. This is pretty impressive considering Bolton forces were encircling Stannis. Now I'd like to point out that the slaughter of Stannis' forces makes the killing of Shireen and the suicide of Selyse completely useless. They could have just died in battle, and Stannis could feel just as guilty about bringing his daughter and wife to war. So in the end, the burning of Shireen was purely for shock value. It didn't advance the plot at all. Unless... we'll get back to this. Anyway, Ninja Stannis fights off two more guys in order to die quietly next to a tree. But who has snuck by all of Bolton's forces? Why, it's Ninja Brienne. Brienne, you are incredible. You've been seeking out three people in the world and have accidentally stumbled into all three. Arya, Sansa, and Stannis. I have trouble finding my car keys in the morning. They should send you out to find Benjen. Now quite oddly, Brienne sentences Stannis to die with no legal authority to do so. She's not the lady of any thief. If this is legal, she should really capture him and bring him back to Tarth and have him sentenced there. But that is kind of the point, and I admit, I do kind of like this scene. Stannis, very concisely, tells Brienne to do her duty. It's honestly the best thing you could say to Brienne. Stannis sized her up, figured out she was an honor-obsessed wannabe knight, and said the right thing. Knights don't execute wounded people. And not that Stannis would know this, but Brienne's duty was to rescue Sansa not kill Stannis. 
And yes, of course Stannis survived this scene. You don't cut away from the action when you want to kill somebody. This is why Quentin is probably alive. Which brings me to my unless. Stannis, after staring at all of those maps and being the most brilliant military commander in the Seven Kingdoms, just blindly runs into battle? If I were writing this, I would make Shireen's burning mean something. Half of Stannis' forces didn't desert. He ordered them away. Ramsay's slaughter of Stannis' forces was a trick. That's why Stannis had retreated to the woods. He knew he was going to fight another day. He knew that the stronger half of his army was out there. The Boltons have been lulled into a position of confidence when, in fact, Stannis is on top. Now, one may counter-argue and say, hey, the show is a piece of crap. Now, yes, that's true, but again, Stannis is clearly planning something in the book, and if they're trying to follow the book to any degree, there has to be a trick in Stannis' strategy. Now, Ramsay is still out there kicking butt, though he doesn't have very many men left. He kills a man who surrenders, which actually is a mercy killing. No one wants to be captured by a Bolton. Meanwhile, back at Winterfell, Sansa decides she wants to escape and starts walking upstairs. She's caught by Miranda, who decides that she's going to take it upon herself to start torturing Sansa with a wooden arrow. Mmm, Miranda, gangrene, not smart to do with the key to the north. Anyway, despite the fact that Sansa only walked up one story, Miranda seems to fall four. So, what exactly was Sansa's plan? Why was she climbing this high? Did she think that she was just going to jump off the wall? Because it seems like Theon got the idea out of desperation. So what was Sansa thinking? Step 1. Unlock door. Step 2. Walk across the yard and hope no one notices or cares. Step 3. Light candle for supposed rescuer, who is most likely dead or fled considering the go-between was flayed by Ramsay. Step 4. If step 3 fails, and one would have no idea if it did, climb the walls. And step 5. Profit. Meanwhile, back in Bravos, Marin fucking Trant is punishing schoolgirls for not doing their homework. Killing Sirio? Not evil enough. Beating Sansa? Not evil enough. Homophobe? Not evil enough. Mace Tyrell hater? Not evil enough. Pedophile? Not evil enough. Sadistic pedophile? Okay, now the audience isn't with him. But then, oh my god, one is Arya! You killed Sirio! Ah god, this is really needlessly violent! Of course, the big irony is that Sirio's probably still alive. After all, they cut away. At the House of Black and White, the Faceless Men have caught Arya because, honestly, she couldn't have been more sloppy. And kindly Hagar commits suicide to pay for the death that Arya took. So, if you save somebody's life, you've got to kill somebody. But if you kill somebody, you've got to kill somebody. What are the rules at the House of Black and White? Forget your chores? Gotta kill somebody. Accidentally break a dish? Gotta kill somebody. Fifteen minutes late for lunch? Gotta kill somebody. Anyway, we have a pretty cool scene where we learn that Jockin was probably not Jockin, and Arya goes blind. Though I'm not sure how they did this. Meanwhile, down in Loras' birthmark, everyone is saying goodbye to each other. And, hmm. This is quite obvious. And Tyene says to Bronn, You want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. David Benioff Friedman, undergraduate, Dartmouth College. Master's degree in creative writing from Trinity College, Dublin. Daniel Brett Weiss, undergraduate, Wesleyan University. Master's degree in Irish literature from Trinity College, Dublin. Master's degree in creative writing from Iowa University's Writer's Workshop. You want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. Let's just take in that writing for a while. <sighs> anyway, on the ship, Marcella tells Jamie that she's totally cool with the incest, and she's glad that Jamie's her dad. But no touching scene can go unpunished, and so Marcella dies of poisoning. Now I think it's pretty clear to everyone, including Jamie, that Ilaria poisoned Marcella. And it's fairly clear that Doran was in on it, he even nods to Ilaria to give Marcella the kiss. So why did they hand Jamie Tristane? This seems like a stupid, 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 stupid plan. And Ilaria tries to throw her handkerchief in the water, but it blows back and doesn't fall in. A perfect metaphor to the whole Loris's birthmark storyline. An absolute fucking failure. Meanwhile in Marine, Jorah, Tyrion, and Dario are hanging out thinking about what they're going to do with themselves. And hey, Grey Worm is alive! Anyway, Tyrion wants to go out and find Daenerys, but Dario nixes that idea because Tyrion isn't that good at fighting or riding. 
Dario's logic is fairly sound. Grey Worm is the only person that has legitimacy to rule the city, and Tyrion's a smart guy. My problem with his logic is there are a group of people that are really good at riding, and fighting, and tracking, who would be perfect to find Daenerys. Daenerys is blood riders, but they got Chuck Cunninghammed in third season. So it's Dario and Jorah. Dario says he has a lot to talk about, like how he's teamed up with the Ironborn. So Tyrion watches the Super Dario brothers head off to rescue the princess, and then all of a sudden, holy shit, Varys is here! Dude, how'd you get past security? Meanwhile, off in the Dothraki Sea? Daenerys can't get her car to start, and her dress is completely ruined. So she decides to try to walk to the nearest gas station when, oh crap, Dothraki. She's completely surrounded, so she decides to drop a ring so her friends will know she was there? Hey Daenerys, charred bones and 75,000 tons of horse shit. I'm pretty sure the Dario brothers will piece it together. Meanwhile in King's Landing, Cersei finally breaks and confesses to some of her crimes. For banging Lancel and lying, she has to do a walk of shame. And what can be said? Lena Headey can act. She doesn't speak for nearly 10 minutes. She starts out strong, and slowly but surely, she begins to break down. It's a very impressive scene. And at the end, we're finally treated to Sir Robert Strong. Meanwhile at the Wall, Davos is trying to get the Wildlings to fight for Stannis. But then the conversation becomes useless as Melisandre arrives, and it's implied that Stannis is dead. And Davos mourns Shireen. Jon is feeling pretty depressed, but then Ollie tells him that Benjen is still alive. Benjen? Jon heads out to talk to a wildling about it and, ah, oh, fuck, you cock teases. I was not expecting Alistair to be there, but obviously the Jar Jar of the Watch was going to stab Jon. The special love I had for you, my baby blue. And that brings us to the end of the season, but I'm going to do a review of the entire season as well next week. So look for that, and see you then.